Friday of Friday evening. Today we have architect Saurabh Bilal from Design Plus Architecture. A quick introduction on architect Saurabh Bilal. Architect Saurabh Bilal is an alumni of CEPT and the founder partner of Design Plus Architecture, an architectural company involved in master planning, architecture and interior design, found in 1985. First as Pazio and in 2010 as Design Plus. The firm has several award-winning projects to their credit. The practice encompasses a range of building types, including commercial, retail, mixed use, institutional, residential, and hospitality projects. This includes projects like Westin and Holiday in Gurgaon, the NASCOM headquarters Noida, numerous commercial buildings for DLF, IRIO, and the Vatika Group. Currently, the prestigious projects under design are the Heinz Center in Gurgaon in collaboration with PCPA in New York and two large mixed use developments for INGKA centers, IKEA in the NPR. Architect Saurabh has been a speaker at several national and international events and on the jury of several prominent competition projects. His project, the Taj Vivanta in Bangalore in collaboration with WOW Singapore, won the Singapore Institution, Institute of Architecture, Architects Build, Building of the Year Award in 2010 and also the LEAP Award in London the same year. The boys' residence at the Thapar University at Patiala was shortlisted in the institutional section at the World Architecture Festival in Amsterdam in 2018. Innovation, creativity, and energy are the cornerstones of Architect Saurabh's success. Injecting enthusiasm in all projects, he is skillfully able to translate the client's vision into cutting-edge design. So once again, welcome to Architect Tonic. Thank you very much, and thank you to LNT for arranging this wonderful series and for having me on the talk this Friday evening. Thank you so much, sir. We all are very excited. Uh, this is the 14th session which we have at Architect Tonic, and every week we have been having a different topic. Today's session looks quite interesting, and the topic which is in between spaces. So, sir, for our audience, we have a mix of architects and interior designers join in from Pan India. So, we all are excited to know that, as indicated by you, what does in between spaces mean, sir? If you can elaborate on it. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, as I said, good evening, friends. Um, I am thankful to LNT for arranging the session today. You know, the when LNT spoke to me a couple of weeks ago about the series that they were doing and asked me to you know, what I'd like to speak upon. Um, I, the one thing that came to my mind uh, was this topic of what I call in between spaces. Uh, you know, as architects, uh, we lay a lot of emphasis on the buildings we design, on the interiors we design, and we don't, uh, sometimes we, I think we tend to ignore the spaces in between the buildings. So I think it's an interesting subject. I think it's something that needs uh, a lot of paying attention to. So uh, that's uh, that's why I chose to talk about this today. And uh, it's, it's a very vast topic, so I thought I would restrict it to in-between spaces in institutional architecture. A quick word about that. You know, actually, institutional architecture is something that we as a practice started looking at uh, much more recently. And uh, the nice thing about uh, institutional architecture is that, you know, efficiencies, FSIs, and those sort of, and ground coverages sort of take second importance and space making, I think is really what is of primary importance. So uh, I think you get this, this opportunity for space making. And in that case, even the in-between space is much more in institutional projects than you might get in some of the other building types. Uh, for today's uh, discussion, I have chosen a project that we have recently completed part of. We've completed phase one and phase two, which is the Thapur University in Patiala, which was uh, done in conjunction with Makalo Matala out of Dublin. Um, the first phase was the Boyd Hostel, which uh, we, we will look at first, and then we had the learning center also over there. So using these two projects as examples, I want to really demonstrate what we really mean uh, uh, when we talk about in between spaces, both at the sort of the building or the block level as well as at a site level. So, this, um, you know, so when we talk of in between spaces, I think uh, the, the best definition I could give is that, especially at a site level, these would include spaces like courtyards, 
uh, under crafts, you know, um, and and at the and within the buildings spaces like atriums and and other you know sort of uh, circulation spaces like that. So uh, as I said, these these uh, spaces have sort of fascinated me as an architect uh, for the last many years, and I wanted to show you how we've used these spaces to really enhance the architecture uh, at uh, both these projects that we, we're going to talk about today. So, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, campus of Thapar University at Patiala was a, it's a 60 year old campus. Uh, it's been uh, in existence for many years and about three or four years ago, they decided to do a, like uh, a rejuvenation of the entire campus and we selected, you know, this sort of central axis along with uh, the uh, two major building types. Uh, what is at the back, you see block A, which is the boys hostel, and in the front is the learning center. Hello? Yes, sir, we can see. That. Yeah, uh, so uh, these are the two new introductions to the campus. And uh, these are the two projects we'll talk about in a little more detail today. Thank you so uh, much, sir. Yeah, the um, the boys' hostel is a cluster actually of seven buildings which sit on top of a podium. Uh, now, by sitting on a podium, this really gives us uh, in between spaces at two levels. We have spaces at the podium level, and we have spaces at what we call the undercraft or ground level. The nice thing about this is that depending on the climate and the climatic conditions at the, that particular point in the year, students would either choose to sit out in the open on the podium or if it's during the warmer months in the shade at the uh, at the sort of ground or undercroft level. So these, uh, I think creating these spaces, creating spaces where students can interact, where students can interact with uh, professors is always something that is very, very important in institutional architecture. Um, uh, quickly, uh, I'll go through the plan. You know, we picked up one building block, which we look at in a little more detail, and we arranged these uh, in in uh, in varying uh, configurations on the site, uh, such that you know the spaces that we got between these blocks became more dynamic. You know, it's just not taking one block and repeating it in the on the same axes. Uh, all across the podium. So just by rotating the block, uh, so sometimes by 90 degrees, sometimes by 180 degrees, we were able to create these varying space types within the block, which is what we really refer to as the in-between spaces. So here you can see how first, you know, and, and, and these blocks had a smaller footprint at the ground level. And as they come up, uh, there was a sort of a, a cantilevered podium on which the upper floors sit. Uh, to create a larger block at the upper levels. A quick plan of this, so as you can see at the first two levels, we have fewer rooms uh, at the ground and podium levels. And then once we come up to the first floor, we get the full cluster of rooms uh, in this sort of a, um, I will, just a trapezoid oil shape. A slightly blown up view of that. And I think on this slide, what I'd also like to talk about is, you know, so we were first looking at these spaces at a macro level, which is between the building blocks. But I think in between spaces, and especially for all our interior designers who are with us here today on the talk, uh, you know, it's these spaces between the rooms, which is also in a sense an in-between space. So instead of keeping these as sort of what would typically be a boring double loaded door, you know, with rooms on either side. We've actually used the social spaces uh, between the rooms, and that's the space which is again sort of creating interaction between the students at a particular floor level. Uh, if you look at the plan on the right, you know, I think what we were trying to show there was that even in section, we've actually modulated this in between space. So uh, at one level, you have uh, a common space between rooms and there's a cutout amongst other rooms and then that uh, transfers to uh, to the opposite way. I'll show it to you in section when you get to the next floor. So, um, yeah, so this is uh, just an early rendering of what some of those spaces might be, uh, you know, and as I said, it, you can see here that 
The cutouts varied from one section of the building to the other. Uh, the top left, there was a small picture of one of the typical rooms. And these are on the typical floor, we had a combination of uh, double rooms and single rooms. Uh, that's what, we, but two double rooms share a common toilet bank each. Uh, the, uh, uh, again, these pictures show you how, as I said, this cutout really varies. And it's actually, of course, these pictures were taken, uh, you know, I, I think during the off, uh, during the holiday months. But uh, when you actually visit the campus while the campus is in session, uh, these become very, very vibrant spaces. Uh, in uh, one, of, one of the important things is that when you're looking at the exterior uh, in between spaces, I think it's important that you do something to the building facade, which also promotes uh, the feeling of that space within. So in this project, we've used these GRC screens uh, right across you know, the balconies of the hostel. So the top left is a picture from the room looking out onto that balcony space. So each room gets that balcony. And then there's a night view to show you what the entire, you know, it, it, there are some very interesting silhouettes, a, a very interesting play of light and shadow, which you get, you know, with these screens. Uh, coming to at the block level, you know, so uh, this is what uh, this is a plan at the podium level. As you can see that between the blocks, it's not just uh, a sort of a flat slab, which is landscape. We've created lots of cutouts in the slab to allow light to percolate to the ground levels also. So we've sort of selectively cut the slab and sculpted the slab at this level to have very controlled right light uh, at that ground level. So this is what the plan at the podium level would be. And you, as you can see, we have created a few spaces for seating uh, in the evenings. Actually, what happens is that they actually have a couple of people coming and selling juice here and maybe snacks here. And the nice thing is that actually this podium, you don't see it in any of the pictures, but it actually overlooks the cricket field. So a lot of kids actually would gather at the podium level and look onto a match if it was happening at that particular point in time. Uh, this is the level, this is the, uh, uh, when you're at the ground level. So as you can see, there are seven blocks, but on the top left, uh, we also have uh, a dining hall here. There are two dining halls for this, for this group of seven hostels. And there is uh, a small gym um, and a cafeteria also, which, uh, which really completes the activity at the ground level. So there some of the social uh, activities are placed at the ground level uh, in easy access to all seven blocks. Um, this is some of the shots that you can see uh, of this project after the first phase was completed. So these are levels more, I mean, these are photographs more at the podium level. And uh, again, what I'd like to sort of stress on here is that, you know, there are these voids, there are, there are bridges connecting various blocks. So it's not just one dead landscape slab at that podium level. That slab also has large cutouts in it to allow light to get in. And as I said, we, we, we looked at, we looked at you know, some of the, the, the sun directions, we looked at uh, wind directions, when we actually decided on, as I said, how to sculpt this slab at this level and create air flows at that lower level also. Um, so here you can see all these blocks are sort of uh, covered with this GRC scheme, which gives you a very uniform facade to all the seven blocks. So even if there are, you know, kids um, sort of, uh, you know, buying clothes on their balconies and things like that, uh, a lot of that gets screened out. We we actually did a lot of work on these screens. You know, there was a very fine balance between trying to create, I mean, we, we wanted to avoid the rooms feeling like people were in a jail. You know, they shouldn't feel that they're behind bars in a jail really. So, so we looked at various uh, patterns. We looked at various uh, dimensions uh, before we actually uh, finalize this. And the nice thing is the feedback we've got from the kids has been quite positive. I think they're all quite happy that, you know, uh, some of the, their activities on the balcony doesn't get sort of uh, shown to the whole world. 
Uh, this is just a larger picture showing you, you know, what these screens look like during the day. Uh, it was also a fairly cost effective way of really uh, enclosing these buildings because some of the other materials, of course, were, were far more expensive. We've, uh, I'll show you in the next section when we talk about the learning center there, we looked at far more elaborate screens. Uh, but uh, I think given the climate here in Patiala, it's sort of very harsh during the um, uh, during the hot summer months and during the cooler months, you want the airflow and the sort of breeze to pass through. So it's been an effective uh, medium to allow both of those things to happen. Um, yeah, there are these sort of giant staircases that take you from the ground level up to the podium level. And uh, I mean, again, these become nice spaces. I mean, in themselves, you know, again, during the session, you'll see a lot of kids in the evening sitting on these steps in groups. And so I think it's things like this that you can do. Uh, so the nice thing about, uh, and I just wanted to bring up that point again here is that the nice thing about uh, institutional architecture is that you can actually uh, create these spaces without worrying about FSI getting consumed or about what efficiencies you're achieving. Because as I said, uh, it's really all about place making uh, and less about uh, sort of building efficiencies. Um, the, uh, and, and actually I think there is a payback on all of this because it's these spaces that eventually promotes interaction between the students, which is really the most important component of your educational, you know, the, the three or four years that you might spend at the Institute. Now, uh, some of these pictures are at the ground level. We have a large water body in the center, which also helps to create some sort of a mi microclimate at that level. And as you can see that even though we have a podium floating up uh, in quite a large section of this, it still feels very open. You, know, you don't sort of feel that you're in a basement or you're in a sort of a lower ground floor of any sort. You know, it is, uh, there is a lot of light and ventilation uh, because, as I said, the slab was sort of selectively sculpted to allow this. Um, at this lower level, on the lower left, you can see that's a picture of the dining hall. The dining hall uh, is at two levels. We, um, uh, we, we needed to do that to sort of create those capacities. And uh, so the gym, the dining hall, the cafeteria all, are all accessible off these in-between spaces between the blocks at the ground floor. And the sort of closing shot uh, on this first section uh, of that presentation really is, I think it's a very serene, it gives you a very sort of calm, quiet, and uh, it, it, the, the atmosphere here in the evenings at dusk, uh, late evenings is quite spectacular. Okay, so um, Ankita, should we, how would you like to do this? Should we move on to the second section? Should I complete this? Or do you think we should pause here and let, if people have questions on that first section, we talk about that? Uh, how we, would you like to run this? We can, or we can do that. We can have questions on the first session. And so also I have a question regarding the first PPT. It was quite interesting. So while we get questions from the audience, I would like to ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, to you, sir, we did see uh, the in-between spaces uh, in the institutional architecture. How would these spaces vary in other building types like retail or hospitality? And according to you, what turns into a significant angle while planning for spaces? So before we shift, if you would want to take up that. Okay, so, you know, um, I think that is actually uh, probably uh, captures the essence of this presentation, really, you know, and I think I cheated a little bit by choosing institutional architecture, because as I said, it allows you to create the uh, uh, fairly spectacular uh, in between spaces. So I think you see, uh, in, when you get to commercial projects, you know, uh, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, a commercial project has to make money. I mean, uh, if, if the developer isn't able to make money off the project, then I think the project is not successful. And I think the architect is as responsible for that, you know, as anybody else. So uh, in, in, in other building types, in offices, in uh, retail, in mixed use projects, we do have lots of in-between spaces. 
So especially when we talk about the internal in-between spaces, since they all really start, you know, in some way or the other getting counted either in the FSI of the project or in the, uh, you know, in the um, efficiencies, you know, in some cases now, I mean, in a, in a lot of parts of the country, uh, ATMs are allowed. Sometimes they're only counted in ground coverage. Sometimes they're allowed, they're free of FAR. But uh, I think also for commercial reasons, you need to sort of keep those a bit under control. So I say, I would say that's how it varies uh, in, uh, at least in the office projects. And we have a lot of office projects with ATMs in them. Uh, okay. At the site level, um, I think there may be not too much difference because, you know, how you play, you know, the space in between, if you were doing a campus of say four or five office buildings, mm -hmm. there is no reason why you couldn't treat it very similarly to where, the way we treated these seven blocks, you know, and create some interesting covered and semi-covered spaces between them. In fact, I think in, in some, in, especially in office uh, campuses, Creating these spaces is as important as doing it in institutional architecture because at the end of the day, you know, you want people to interact. Uh, yes. I would also like to add that, you know, we've all been in the midst of a, a very, very, I would say, a different phase that anybody has really experienced over the last four or five months with the whole pandemic situation. Uh, the, the, I think this is going to give rise to uh, uh, you know, uh, people trying to utilize the outdoors a lot more effectively than the indoors, you know, because obviously it's much safer to be in the outdoors. So I think, you know, creating, and, and we have, I mean, we can't run away from the climate type that we live in. So I think as architects, we'd be forced to think about what we can do creatively with these between spaces in office campuses, in mixed use and retail projects, make them more usable by our people. Thank you so much, sir. We can, uh, I do have a few more questions, but I think we can carry on with the other part of the presentation. Maybe then I would want to take that up. Okay, sure. I'll open up for the Q&A from the audience. Okay, great. So, you know, the second section deals with the second phase of the project, and this was actually handed over just, you know, at the end of last year. So it's really pretty fresh out of the oven uh, some of the buildings here yeah. and uh, you know there were uh, uh, three buildings that we were asked to look at in the first phase of the learning center uh, comprising of the library the uh, lecture theater building uh, which has i think 16 or 18 uh, lecture halls in them of various sizes and the computer science building which is probably uh, one of the more popular faculties today in any tech university. So I think they wanted a new building for the computer science faculty, uh, since it is something that most of the kids, kids are opting for today. So here again, you know, we uh, when we looked at this project with uh, MCM and, you know, uh, I must say it was a great working relationship with them. Uh, uh, the, the reason why we worked with MCM was that Harvard University has a, had got into a very significant relationship with uh, Trinity College in Dublin, uh, and uh, uh, McCallum Malvin had done uh, uh, quite a lot of work with Trinity College. They knew their standards, they knew, you know, the, the requirements there. So I think it made for a good team. Uh, and as I said, I think it's 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 been a great learning experience for us, and uh, hopefully for them also. So, uh, the, so this is the 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 essence of this 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 particular building, the the learning center. As I said, which has really three components was what we wanted was that while we have very definitive buildings for these three different functions, the ground level or what we call the undercroft should become a melting pot. You know, mm -hmm. uh, that's where all these three buildings come together. When you're at the ground floor, you can't really tell that these are three different buildings. It's only when you come up to this podium level, which you see in this sort of aerial shot that you, you, you make out that there are three different buildings. But when you are at the ground floor, the boundaries of each building actually disappear, you know? Uh, they sort of melt away and you get one really large uh, podium or undercroft level, which is where all these three buildings come together. So, you know, you could be, you know, walking from the library to the computer science building. You might bump at that there could be uh, kids from other faculties at the library. So everybody sort of meets and mingles at that podium level. Uh, 
which is, uh, I think, quite, um, uh, which was really what we wanted to do. Uh, well, as when you are at the podium, uh, you know, the, the, the difference, the three buildings, uh, I mean, we wanted to, to be a little monumental in a way. Uh, I think educational buildings should command respect. And, yes. you know, I think you should be proud of the institute you've sort of been to, you know. Uh, I, I, I actually studied in Ahmedabad and I think some of my nicest memories are visiting, you know, Louis Kahn's Management Institute in Ahmedabad, which is, again, I think one of the finest pieces of uh, institutional architecture that has been built in this country, you know. So, uh, um, I think going ahead from all of that, so that's, that was, as I said, the essence of this project. And uh, I'll try to demonstrate in the next few slides how we try to see this. So, you know, uh, the the top one is just a sketch, you know, and, you know, the, the yellow hatched areas are really the atriums of each of these three buildings. And that sort of thick black line, the horizontal line that runs across at the second level is that podium level. So what you really see from the sketch is that, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the large atriums that you enter in each of these buildings when you uh, actually uh, walk into any of them, uh, get connected at that podium level. And, and you know, it's really, it, it's a series of experiences that you, that you get when you move from one building to the other. So it's um, really quite, uh, so, so, so that was the idea, as I said, that, you know, the, the ground floor should feel like one large campus. And then once you get into the individual buildings, you realize, you know, which of the three faculties you're in. Okay. Uh, the, um, uh, th these are some pictures that we just recently got, uh, uh, again, as I said, so when you're at the podium level, it's the three very distinct buildings, but it's at the lower levels that, you know, uh, you know, you, the, those actually boundaries disappear. So this is a great example of an in-between space, you know, so we had some space between two blocks. We created this sort of little amphitheater there. Uh, between between the blocks, and you know, uh, again because this is shaded, uh, you know, at, at most times of the day, it does get used quite a lot. And uh, I think uh, a great example of what I was trying to really talk about in this presentation today. Uh, here uh, again, you know, the on the building uh, to, to get this sort of unified feel on the building part. We actually looked at, uh, you know, uh, again, doing screens uh, here, you know, because we wanted this sort of monolithic look of red stone that we've used across, the, uh, across this part of the campus. Uh, even the screens were specifically, especially designed, you know, to, to echo that, you know. So uh, we have slabs of stone. And it's a very simple detail that we've used, you know, if you look at the top left plan, just actually place these slabs at various angles. Uh, they're all fixed. So you get, uh, so it's again, not a monotonous uh, rhythm that you get across the facade of the building. By just changing some the angles on some pieces, you know, you get some play in the whole screen and it just makes it that much more dynamic and that much more interesting. So. Sure. Uh, I, I, I love the shot. This is, you know, uh, uh, a picture of one of the buildings. So as you can see, you know, the, the, the bottom of the building uh, at, at the podium level is pretty transparent. We have a lot of glass there. Uh, then the upper few levels, you know, become uh, a little more screened uh, with the same screen that we talked about. And then the top uh, is, is fairly solid, you know. So. Uh, it's it's this sort of variation of different textures across the facade of the building that really creates this effect. And it's equally dramatic in the evenings as it is during the day because, you know, you get sort of selective light filtering out depending on the way those slabs have been really oriented. Uh, coming to uh, some of the um, in between spaces, I must apologize because, you know, soon after this opened, you know, we ran into this pandemic. So we don't have very too many shots uh, of the uh, interior of the building yet. Uh, but, you know, we had some renderings. Uh, so this is a section through the library and the lecture theater building. And uh, just to show you, um, you know, so, so this is what, as I said, it's, it's really these giant atriums 
that run through the building. And you know, these are not uh, these are not sort of boring atriums which are the same shape at every level in plan. Uh, you know, they change. Uh, you know, there are different dimensions at different levels. So the views you get and and you know the experiences you get when you're inside the atrium uh, are quite changing and dramatic. Mm -hmm. uh, these are two uh, on the right is uh, the atrium in the computer science building, which is much more, which is much smaller and sort of more controlled. But the one which is uh, really quite dramatic is the atrium in the library. So you know this. Uh, um uh, the the actually the the on the left the rendering uh, this is the rendering of what the space was sort of envisaged or designed to be um and uh, on the right is a section through that's a part of the atrium but you, as you can see you know the uh, the the, the uh, reading areas are all on the periphery and everything sort of looks down into this massive atrium uh, the atrium also has some the library has some nice terrace gardens at the upper level, uh, which again are fairly popular during certain times of the year, which you really see through those giant skylights. And um, this is the actually I think I need to go forward. Yeah. Uh, so this uh, the the picture on the right uh, is is quite a close. Uh, I would say. This is an actual photograph uh, that we've taken, you know, recently when the when the project was completed. So, if you really compare it to where we started, you know, with with that atrium and uh, where we have uh, finally uh, sort of uh, where the project is it had been completed, uh, fortunately not too much change, which is again something which is nice because I think the the, the clients were very supportive. They they uh, sort of. Uh, back, they, they, I think they respected the designer's decision and backed the decisions right through the project, and that's where we are today. Uh, so both pictures of the library after it's been completed, and then the uh, the last building was the lecture theatre building, which also has uh, a fairly dramatic atrium in it. And then on the right, there are some pictures of the lecture halls, uh, which um, you know. Uh, again, we try to use color to uh, to sort of coat these lecture halls, and it also, I think, adds a bit of vibrancy to the interiors um, of these uh, lecture theaters. So I think that was really uh, Thapar University, and you know, I have a couple of more slides uh, which I I just picked up some examples, just a few examples of some commercial architecture, but I think this would be a good point to really pause. And and talk about these two projects if we do have any questions from the audience. We do have a question, sir. Thank you so much for sharing the presentation from uh, Bandana Singh. Uh, are these atrium spaces air conditioned? Yeah. So you know, um, uh, actually, um, uh, uh, hi Bandana. Bandana is is an old friend, and uh, uh, I I knew she was going to be on the talk today. So it's it's, it's lovely to have a question from her. But yeah. yes, these spaces are air conditioned. I think in our climate, you're sort of forced to do that. But the good thing about HM spaces is that, you know, uh, what happens is even in a space like this, uh, you know, there are, as, as you can see, there's no glass separating the atrium from the, um, uh, you know, from the, from, from the atrium. So, so actually each level gets air conditioned and, and you, that, that's what you do over there. Uh, and then you air condition the ground level, you know, uh, there's also normally a lot of heat build up uh, in, in these atriums. So you need to create some sort of extraction of the hot air at, at, at the top level also. So, yes, these spaces are air conditioned and I think it's something we are forced to do uh, with, with, with the climate. Today. Thank you. But, so you much. Know, as, as, as opposed to that, you know, if we talk about some of those spaces, uh you know in the hostel block i i would like to think of those spaces in between the blocks in a way also like giant atriums you know and they weren't air conditioned you know because as i said there we just relied on uh wind direction and you know where, where we should shade and where we should not shade so uh of course within the uh, uh within the block itself the space was air conditioned but between the blocks 
uh, some of those, those those spaces, I, as I said, I, you could call them courtyards or really giant atriums. Uh, those were obviously not air conditioned. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you, Ms. Bandana. Uh, if you want, we can unmute you if you have any more questions for Saurabh, sir. Rajesh, can you please unmute? Sure. Uh, can you let me know which participant you have? Ms. Bandana Singh. Just a second. Yeah. Uh, I don't see her in the participants list. Mm, no problem. I think. Uh, once you see, just unmute her. We'll take another question, sir. Yeah. We have a question from uh, architect Sveksha Yadav from Lucknow. Right. Yes, sir, you have beautifully interfaced indoor and outdoor spaces. Is integration with landscaping also a part of design palette apart from walls, podiums, or atriums? She means that merging of softscape and hardscape to enhance these in, in between spaces. Yeah, so you know, I I think at the end of the day, it's all really a team effort. You know, uh, we never, whenever we are looking at a project, we don't really look at any of our specialist consultants as somebody who really comes and you know sort of retrofits whatever they want to do uh, onto the project. So you know, they are all very much a part of the team, uh, and I think anything we are seeing today uh, is really. Um, is, is I mean, it's really a contribution of the whole team. Uh, on this particular project, we work very closely with Samir Mathur from Integral Designs. Uh, I think he did a great job to translate uh, a lot of our ideas uh, at the landscape level, you know, into reality. And uh, so, uh, you know, especially, and, and when we are talking, the, the very topic that we're discussing today, this in-between spaces, uh, as I said, we don't want to look at those spaces as little pretty gardens on the outside of the project. You know, they are very much. I mean, the inside has to flow to the outside, and especially as I said in the in the hostel building, I think it played an even more important role. So, yes, uh, uh, we do work very closely. It's and it's not only the landscape or you know uh, consultants like that. Even even you know uh, the question that Banda asked, I think. Uh, if we didn't have the support of our engineers and you know our, the, our structural consultants, you know, to create a structure like this is not really an easy task, even for the structural consultant. You know, and I think everybody has to uh, sort of put in their uh, effort. You know, when we did the boys' hostel, uh, we were very particular that the in in the portion that where we have that sort of extended podium and the rooms on top of that. That we didn't want the room grid to come down to the podium level. We wanted just four. Uh, in fact, I'll quickly show that to you. Yeah. Uh, I think it's it's important to talk about some of these things. So yeah. So I think this shows it very well. So you know, on the right is the full plan of the uh, of the block, uh, and this is uh, you know uh, this happens from level five to nine, from level one to four. We wanted to create this shaded space. Now, the automatic choice would have been to take the columns that you have for the typical floor and just take them down and create a sort of a jungle of columns at that lower level. It would have completely destroyed that space, you know. Uh, instead, we took these four sheer columns uh, and we actually supported the slab above on that. So we got, I mean, we, we got an architectural and structural solution, or, or rather we got a structural solution that really supports the architecture, you know? And that's where I think, whether it's the landscape architect, whether it's the structural engineer, whether it's the MEP engineers, that they all play a huge role in this. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I hope that's answered uh, your question, architect Sveshka. We will be waiting for uh, Ms. Bandana to join in. 
So yeah, she is she is unmute now. Okay. Mandana. Yeah. Uh, hi, Saurabh. It's good seeing you uh, with this presentation. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, I can't see you. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> that's fine. It's it's worth seeing uh, what you've done. I love the atrium spaces and the fact that the structural elements were so, uh, you know, visible. Uh, that was really refreshing to see, you know, your and I think it's beautifully worked out with the angles and the angular grids that you've done. So really well done. Yeah, thank you. As I was saying that, you know, uh, I think, you know, uh, you know, one way is to really have a structure which is sort of very linear and, and boring and then try and create this as a second layer. But here we, uh, you know, I think and I think there's an important point here, Bandana. You know, I think in uh, in our context, and uh, we saw this when we were really, really pitting our projects against other projects at the Architecture Fest of in Amsterdam two years ago. That you know, our because of the uh, I would say restricted funds available for a project, you know, for especially for a lot of projects in India. I think even with the interiors, the architect needs to be very powerful. So you know, it's uh, you you don't need you know, pretty materials to decorate an interior space and try and create the effect that way. I think if the architecture is sort of powerful enough, that uh, goes a long way uh, in, in in really defining that interior space also. So I think when you are uh, working with restricted budgets, uh, I think that's an important lesson to be learned also. Yeah, absolutely. And it's uh, really well done, and it's looking uh, uh, well king size. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Panna, ma'am. So we have a question from Architect Ja from Delhi. Uh, so it's really nice to hear you. As we all can see and observe from the presentation, both minimalistic and repetitive approach can easily be seen. Sir, can this be a guide for the upcoming architects? Well, um, you know, the thing is that uh, I, I'm not sure I got the exact uh, sort of context of, of the question, but what I understand is that, uh, you know, a minimalistic, yes. I mean, I think uh, that would be one way of describing a lot of our work. We, we, we don't like too much uh, embellishment on the work, as I said, I think, we like the architecture to make a sort of a strong statement itself. Uh, and uh, I think as far as a guideline for other architects, I, as I said, I think, again, I would like to repeat the one thing I said earlier, which is that uh, I think in any project, uh, you know, the, 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 the whole team uh, must be really part of what is what we call the design team, you know. Uh, I think some of the greatest architecture that has been created, you know, even in history has really happened between, uh, you know, collab a collaboration between great architects and great structural consultants, for example. And uh, I think uh, going for, for a lot of the kids, what I would say is that, you know, treat your consultants with respect, treat them as equal partners and you will uh, and they will help you create great architecture. Thank you so much, sir. Architect Ja, hope sir has answered your question. We, yes, he, he says thanks. So we have a question from Ms. Elizabeth. Are the walls in the projects using exposed concrete? Uh, yes, um, uh, we, um, uh, yeah, we did use, have used a lot of exposed concrete uh, in this project. Uh, I, I must admit that, you know, some of the quality of the exposed concrete is really not what we would have liked it to be. Uh, and we did have challenges over there. But uh, overall, when you look at it, I think uh, it, it is very strong. Uh, again, you know, the reason why we use concrete was because we, we, we felt that we would rather use the money, you know, to create some of these dynamic spaces rather than do a structure and then, you know, cover it with another material and spend money doing that. So it was a conscious decision. Um, as I said, the, the I think the finish in some areas could have been a little better, but uh, I think maybe it's also part of uh, you know our heritage in the sense that you know we 
uh, I think from the, a lot of the students from uh, Ahmedabad who have sort of studied under people like Doshi and Rajay, uh, you know, exposed concrete was always uh, a, a very popular um, building material to use. And uh, I think probably that's what some of it is imbibed from there. Thank you so much, sir. So, since we have been talking about the institutional architecture and how important is in between space architecture, just the thought, sir, uh, how important do these in between spaces or a transition space in Indian culture and in the designing of housing plans work? Is it important, like a veranda or since we have a lot of interior designers with us, so maybe if you could just elaborate on that, sir. Well, you know, uh, you know, before we go into housing projects, if we if we are talking of uh, in, in you know uh, the individual houses, you know, which is what we all lived in before some of these sort of uh, condominium projects and things became popular. So, you know, uh, traditionally, all Indian houses had a courtyard. I think that's the greatest example of an in-between space that has evolved over history, really, you know. Uh, in, in, in India, the courtyard was built for various reasons, you know. It had climatic reasons, it had social reasons. And uh, I think it's really, uh, I mean, I think it's something that taught the West a lot also, you know. I mean, it's really part of uh, our Indian architectural heritage. Uh, also, you know, um, if you look at Vastu, uh, I mean, I, I, I won't pr sort of proclaim to be uh, uh, sort of an expert on Vastu at all. But what I do know is that, you know, the central portion of the building always needs to be, you know, the lightest and, and empty in that sense, you know. And uh, so what, what they really refer to as the Brahmastal. So basically, I feel that it is very much a part of our culture. Uh, you know, it's, it's rules and ideas like that, like this, that have really throughout history promoted these in-between spaces. And uh, so, yes, it's part of our heritage. I think they've played a very useful role. And it's great to see how these have really evolved over time. Thank you so much, sir. We have a question uh, from Ms. Keshvi Shah in regards to this project. She, uh, she wants to know what are the advanced materials used in this project, the boys' hostel? Well, uh, actually, very simple materials, you know. I mean, uh, the... Let me just get back to some of the pictures. So, so as I said, that uh, the only thing I would say is a little bit out of the ordinary uh, are these GRC screens. You know, uh, so we, you know, we started off with, you know, we first, in fact, even considered stone, like we've done in the the, the uh, learning center. We quickly discarded that for for budgetary reasons. Uh, we looked at metal. We looked at aluminium. Uh, and then actually we uh, we chose um, uh, GRC um, and actually we're, we're we're quite happy. I think what GRC that did is that because of the very nature of the material, the sections are normally a little thicker than they might have been in metal. I think that's overall we feel at the end of the project that that's given a little bit of body to the project. And uh, but besides that. It's con just concrete. Uh, there is, uh, uh, of course, just concrete and block work on the inside. Let me see if we have a couple of pictures. Um, yeah, so again, a very simple materials on the inside. We had, you know, tiles on the floor. Uh, we wanted to use uh, uh, a terrazzo uh, actually right across the floor because uh, I think, especially in terms of building types where uh, the, it's the, you know the, sometimes the usage can be quite rough, uh, you need a floor that you can actually polish and maintain, uh, you know, from time to time. Uh, we uh, we eventually were forced to use tiles because of uh, time constraints, but uh, in the next three blocks that we do, we are going to ensure that we use uh, terrazzo. We think that definitely uh, would have been a much better selection of material. So fairly simple materials, even with the, uh, as you can see on the inside of the room, uh, you know, uh, laminate on the furniture and uh, and just simple floors and and uh, some of the walls are left as exposed concrete. The slab also is an exposed concrete slab. Thank you so much, sir. 
we have a lot of questions in fact we have one question from mr shiv choudhury he says a sort of so thank you for a wonderful session so what suggestion would you like to give me for using corridors of a play school especially play group area corridors to make them more lively and creative cheerful for kids of play group please suggest so i think it's a suggestion okay so you know my first thought would be you know break up the corridor wherever you can you know uh, a, a long monotonous corridor uh, is not going to serve any purpose it will be efficient but in a school again you don't need to make it that efficient so if you could actually break up the corridor uh, certain places you know there is a gap between say the classroom that will allow some amount of light to percolate into the corridor and you know the great thing about in between spaces that they don't need to be vast you know uh, again in a school in the context of a school uh, sometimes you know if they are very vast they actually the, 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 they lose scale and you know uh, people will sort of deter that will deter people, the kids from going into those spaces so i think one of the things you need to be very careful about when you are looking at these in between spaces is to ensure that you get the right scale you know Uh, if they're too small, they won't be used. If too large, they won't be used. And I think that's where the trick lies. But just break up the corridor. You know, we did a. Uh, in fact, it's a different project. Uh, we did a hotel for um, Holiday Inn uh, in uh, in Delhi in Aero City a couple of years ago. And I think uh, there again, you know, for uh, efficiency and budgetary reasons. <laughs> we were forced to look at double loaded corridors otherwise you know they just it just becomes too expensive but what we did is that when you came out of the lift core and before you got into the room corridor we just we just by i think eliminating one or two rooms we were able to bring natural light which brought natural light both into the corridor as into the lift lobby as well as into the corridor and just that little bit of uh, 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 you know helped so much to break what would really be the monotony of a long corridor so i think uh, wherever you can punctuate the corridor you know in uh, introduce small gardens where you can introduce natural light where you can um it's just a very simple and effective way to create some interest in the program thank you so much sir we have a question from kripa anna this is sir this is a wonderful project thank you for sharing i would like to ask what are the constraints you have encountered concerning design besides the budget during this project so any challenges Shibu? yeah uh, i think um, uh, i think technology was 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 a great challenge you know the thing is that as i said when you want to create spaces like this uh, uh, the i think uh, uh, we challenged our consultants a lot you know very often we were told that something might not be possible but you know we tried to see we we worked closely with them to see how we could make it possible uh, so always uh, so, so when you work with this it's not only the budgets you see the budget uh, definitely put certain constraints uh, you know on the project but i think you need to be careful about where you spend the money you know uh, and you know where are you going to get as they say i mean there's a common phrase which is where do you, do you really get the maximum bang for your buck you know and i think that again i think that's an important decision that the architect needs to take and spend the money if you're going to be able to do that uh, so uh, technology is one challenge and you know uh, i think just dealing with the whole uh, with the construction industry and uh, ankita that i mean i think that's where you come in a bit also you know i think the, the your uh, you know your contractors and your builders will always try and you know dissuade the client uh, saying that something is very expensive to do and i think if you as the architect uh, are convinced that it is not i'll i'll give you a small example you know i uh, i have a friend of close to the career any chatterjee who i think has created some of the most wonderful architecture in this country especially when it comes to sort of single family residences and you know uh, he used to do these very beautiful houses in exposed concrete and every time he would tender the project uh, you know the, uh, the 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 
the quotes that he would get back from the contractors were so prohibitive that it would put off the client. And, you know, he suddenly found that a lot of his ideas were getting diluted because the contracting community wasn't really supporting him. And so he got to a stage where he started building these houses himself. And he proved to his clients that actually something that a contractor might be saying is going to cost a huge amount of money is not really true. And he was only able to so solve that problem by actually building these houses himself. And so I think that's another challenge that we as architects face. I think, uh, I think the whole community needs to come together, whether it's the contractors, whether it's specialist vendors, you know, the facade vendors, uh, you know, other interior vendors. Uh, and, you know, uh, to, to ensure that, you know, you can really create what you have really dreamed of at the beginning of the project. Thank you so much, sir. That was quite in depth. And uh, we do have uh, architect Akshay Vedya, sir. He would want to ask you a question. Uh, Prajesh, sure. can you please mute architect Akshay Vedya? Sure. Just unmute him. Yeah. Yes, I think, uh, Mr. Vedya. Just a second. Yeah. Um, Panna ma'am was also asking the end cost per square. So I think we'll take her uh, this. Uh, hi, Akshay. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, Hello. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Yes, architecture, you are audible. Yeah. Hi, hi, sir. I just wanted to say that it's a very beautiful project and the spaces that you have created, they are really nice. They are really, uh, sp spatially, they are really oh, very uh, aptly constructed. And I would say using a simple, using a lot of simple materials, you have created a very harmonious environment inside also. So that that's really a commendable effort and i would like to congratulate you and all all, all your, your team for creating such a wonderful project and sharing it with us thank you so much i just w wanted to ask three questions uh, i had three questions for you so yeah. first of all uh, uh, the the, uh, the my first question would be about the jallies and the air conditioning so uh, uh, i just wanted to ask whether the jallies that you have used to infiltrate light inside the interiors of the building does it does it actually increase the cooling load of the building and do you actually use chill chill slab method of cooling do you use that uh, so you know uh, we have actually used uh, a sort of a chill slab method for cooling only in the library actually okay. what we were advised by our consultant was that you know the chill slab method uh, you know, it takes time for uh, for that area to actually cool. Once it's cool, it's, it's a very cost effective way of doing things. But uh, so in the library, which is a 24-7 operation, uh, it's a very good uh, method to use for the air conditioning, you know. But say in the lecture theaters and things like that, you know, you may use a space for an hour and there's a gap for two or three hours and then you want it cooled. So, you know, it takes time for those large volumes to cool. So we chose to use it only in the library, but not in the other, in some of the other spaces. Dynamic. Okay, great, sir. So just uh, one more thing, and your, your, the jallies, the screens that you have used, doesn't increase the cooling load of, of the building? Obviously, the, the light weight, when it is infiltrating inside the building, it's going to increase the sensible load as well as the cooling load of, of the building. So have you taken that into the account? No, in fact, you know, I would say on the contrary, because, you know, if we didn't have the Jali, I mean, uh, in, in most cases, you know, these, uh, these balconies would have just been open to the elements, you know, Okay. Uh, because we, we definitely, I mean, that was one of the requirements of the, uh, from the client that they felt that, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the, the students do like to have a small balcony, you know, uh, you know, uh, so, so, so really, 
what happens is that by introducing the jali on the periphery, we've actually brought down the heat load because you know it does help to actually cut some of the heat off. Obviously, uh, it, it may be a small percentage, but I would say instead of increasing it, it's actually decreased it. Okay, sir. So, uh, just just the last question that I, I wanted to say that you have used the GRC screen for the staircases. So, did it actually uh, create some kind of problem or some kind of issue with the fire authorities? Because uh, see, the, the fire actually uh, needs to be enclosed to to get the the fire certification or something like that. Did you face actually some some resistance from from the fire department or something like that? No, but you know, so where it needed to be closed, the, the, the screen is really a second skin. There's glass and then there is okay, uh, the that. in front of that. Yeah. yeah. Got that, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Sir, since we, uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, since we were talking about the GRC screens, we have a question from architect Sumit. He says, yeah. hi, good evening, sir. Can we use FRP screens instead of GRC screens? You know, um, I think we did uh, also look at FRP screens at, at one stage. Uh, I think there were two constraints. One was the time. I think the, uh, the, 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 the manufacturers we spoke to, the time periods being sort of uh, quoted for the FRP screens were much higher. Uh, but uh, also, you know, uh, I think, uh, again, uh, you know, the nice thing about a GRC screen is there is a certain rustic feel to it, you know. Uh, it is not as finished as an FRP screen would be, you know. And I think especially uh, as in the hostel blocks, we wanted that, you know, that slightly earthy feel. So, uh, but you know, to answer the question, we did consider them. And I think probably timings, uh, was, uh, at least when we talked to the manufacturers, was one of the main reasons why we did look at it. But in hindsight, I think, we took the better choice from an aesthetic point of view also because i think the frp screens would have looked too finished uh for for the look that we were really trying to create thank you so much sir i uh, that has answered architect sumit's question uh, so we are getting a lot many questions but uh, keeping the time in mind we will just be taking i think a lot of people are finding this question, session quite interesting we'll just take one or two last questions uh, we have a question from architect amulya gupta he says, uh, sir, since in other building typologies like housing, where each and every square feet counts, how do we convince the developer that these open spaces are not a wastage of space, but rather are necessary elements? Yeah, so, you know, um, I, I think this is a, a great question. And, you know, I think this is what I said at the beginning of the talk also. Uh, I think uh, developers will um you know some i i think one of the things that this pandemic will teach the developer community also is that you know you have to create some of these spaces you know in fact talking about housing uh we were doing a competition uh, a couple of months ago uh for um you know for a housing project uh, i'll admit it was housing for uh, again for a company so it didn't have the same commercial connotations that maybe a housing for a developer uh, 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 would have. But I think, so one of the ideas that we used over there was that, you know, uh, we uh, actually create, we skipped, you know, two apartments. It was a, 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 a pretty common, you know, configuration of four apartments to a core. So on one or two floors, we skipped two apartments and created these sky terraces. Uh, which really were uh, again promoting, uh, you know, meetings between the community in smaller groups, you know, which is what people are looking to do more and more of today. So uh, I think uh, even developers, you know, will, I think in the future, not look at these as really a waste of space, but really as a plus point, as an amenity. Uh, you know, for the project, you know, and I think, uh, you know, some of the projects in uh, in some of the other Asian countries like Singapore and Thailand already have a lot of these spaces, you know, they, they create these sort of smaller, more intimate spaces in the housing projects for smaller groups of people and 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 the developer sells it as an amenity, you know, so uh, I hope 
uh, going forward, the our uh, you know the sanctioning authorities also start you know helping the developers to really consider these as amenities as no, and 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 they should really come out of the FAR. They shouldn't really be in the FAR. And and you know if if the if the authorities also sort of help that, I think it will be a win win for everybody. Thank you so much, sir. It has been quite an interactive session from the materials you have used from institutional in between spaces to housing and everything. So we would like to just end this session by just wanting to know that would it be right to say that the function of in between space is to provide the pause moment and also the features like transparency or secrecy since we've spoken about the boys hostel, the housing community. And uh, would their role in the architectural hierarchy be depending to the factor like lifestyle and climate situation? So climate, most definitely, yes. You know, I think, uh, you know, different climates, different geographies, you know, will have a, a very significant bearing on the type of in-between spaces that you create, you know. Uh, but, I mean, you know, here we suffer from, uh, you know, uh, a lot of heat and, of course, uh, rain at some parts of the year. But in other countries where, 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 you know, it's a very cold climate, you know, uh, you'll have to, your in-between spaces will really have to be designed such that you can actually catch maximum sunlight in those. You know, you don't want to shade against the sun over there. So mm -hmm. climate always will play, I think, an important role in these in-between spaces. Uh, you, some of, uh, what were some of the other points you talked about? Um, so the transparency, is it right to say that the in-between space is uh, basically to provide a pause moment, like also keeping the features like transparency and at the same time the secrecy? Well, you know, uh, in fact, uh, I don't know whether, uh, again, in different projects, I think you will really decide whether you want pause moments or not. Mm -hmm. Here, as I said, it was pretty much the opposite. We created these spaces to actually promote interaction between people you know we uh, we uh, we did a, a small project for which was the nascom headquarters uh, in noida a couple of years ago and there again you know a lot of the spaces you know uh, were created as these sort of in between spaces some of them were open to sky landscape areas some of them were semi covered areas some of them were covered areas but it was actually done to to promote interaction between people um, but, you know, again, uh, uh, somebody talked about these housing projects, you know, you created some of these spaces, they could become pause moments for some part of the community at certain times of the day. Correct. Thank you so much, sir. We will end the session. But before that, there is one last question from Upasna. Uh, she wants to know, sir. Uh, I would like to. I would like to ask you how to create a basement effective. As in today's era, we have very little space to build, so everybody wants to use it very effectively. So she would like to know what strategies would you use for making such basements. So you know, as you can see, I think you know from this presentation and even from some of our other projects, I think one of the most important elements in architecture is light. You know. Uh, and uh, anything you can do to create some, uh, you know, a little bit of natural light coming into that basement is going to grow a long way, uh, you know, in, in enhancing this feeling of that space, you know. And I think what uh, I would say is that it doesn't need to be a large courtyard bringing light, you know, even if it's uh, a simple, if it's a linear shaft, you know, uh if it's you know it doesn't need to be more than a meter sort of deep and if it's and if it's a long linear shaft and that brings light and you have sort of glass along that wall of the basement it makes uh it's it creates uh, it's it's a very very uh it, it really helps to create a dramatic effect to that basement you know we uh, again at that holiday Inn project in um in in, in aero city we created a very small court at the basement level uh, and we did it actually more to allow, because that's where the, the banquets were, so we did it more to allow people to go out into that court and smoke. What we actually realized later on was that that little court was bringing in a lot of light into the pre-function spaces of the banquet and became a, a, a highly appreciated feature as part of that whole banquet space, you know. 
So they don't need to be large, uh, but wherever you can bring natural light into whatever space you can, and it will help to dramatically alter that space. Thank you so much, sir. I think we will have to stop taking questions because people are finding this quite interesting and we've been receiving a lot of questions. I'm again sorry, uh, we would mm -hmm. not be able to take everyone's questions. But sir, on behalf of everyone and LNT, again, I would like to thank you. It has been a quite informative session. We are getting a lot of messages from all our architect and interior designers friends that it has been very informative from them, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Ankita. Thank you to LNT for you know sort of hosting me, and so much. Uh, we look forward to uh, similar sessions in the future. Sure, sir. Thank you so much, and thank you everyone for spending your Friday evening with uh, me and Saurabh, sir. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. Bye, -bye sir. Have a happy weekend. Bye, bye. Thank you. And and to everybody, have a safe weekend. Yes, safe weekend. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much.